Good morning, everyone. Before, uh, whilst we're getting our speakers ready for with the microphones, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Wenhua Li Li, and for the last 14 years, actually, I've worked with Chas, all this lovely band from SGC in Oxford, and. Since February, I'm the CEO of a new research charity called Action Against AMD, Age-Related Macular Degeneration, where we try to look into ways to not uh, look into the late stage in, uh, uh, engagement, because it's already been a lot, but actually how to prevent. Um, but before I can get, get started, I would like to invite my fellow colleagues to join us in the panel, please. So until five, ten years ago, things were actually thought to be realms of science fiction, such as gene therapy and also immunology, are ah, becoming true, stem cells as well. And, and this has actually opened very new horizons for truly transformative treatments. But arguably, arguably, one of the most interesting transformations nowadays is actually how the older stakeholders have moved from being very close, isolated, to be much, much more collaborative. I think the audience today and all the major narratives around these themes is uh, showing that is the right, this is the direction of travel. However, the concept of open science is still rather fluid and with different implementations and degrees of success. And recently, you can look at the literature, you can look at all the debates, there's been significant efforts in trying to frame it or formalizing the transactional elements of the open science. But one thing that I would like to start discussing this with the panel and also the audience is perhaps that the potential transformative potential of open science resides in the way we do knowledge exchange. Yes. Um, so to help explore this topic, I'm joined by three good friends here in the panel. And uh, that's not to say I would not be tough with the questioning. And so won't you, all right? You, I will invite you to really grill us up here. Um, first of all, we have Professor Trish Grinald, who is a professor of primary health care in Oxford. We do have Kai Stuber, who is the vice president of global innovation at Shunogi. Uh, and fourth, Chas Bountra, who is the pro vice chancellor of innovation and also chief scientist at the Structured Genomics Construction in Oxford. So in the interest of time, I'd like to just kick off uh, by pointing out that we've mentioned before, there seems to be a, somewhat of a perceived increased tension as open models are uh, moved from basic science closer to what the market is perceived to be. Um, so I would like to ask you whether you think that the open is ripe for these late stages of drug discovery and translation, or is this a balancing act? Or actually, rather, is the existing imbalance perceived imbalance between ownership, stakes, and rewards, absolutely necessary, something we cannot escape uh, for a strong translation. Please. It's a lady's first, is it? Well, I'm, I'm not an, <laughs> I'm not an expert in open science. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, but I also uh, am a social scientist, and I study complex systems. And the more I study complex systems, the more I think there are never any right answers which are the only answers to any particular question. So any question that is framed as if there is one particular answer is probably not the right question. I think when we're studying any complex system, what we need to do is identify the tensions, identify the paradoxes, identify uh, the patterns, and the best we can ever do in a complex system is to manage those tensions. We're never going to be, be able to develop the perfect system for this. Mm. It, it, that, that's a theoretical point. I'm not going to hand over to one of these other guys who know more about this particular topic. Okay, perhaps you, sir. So, um, excellent question. I think, I think this question has to be answered in, in, in a context. I think um, if you are, where we are facing situations where there's very high risk, um, very high investment, um, yeah, largely risk and investment. Pharmaceutical companies and all the other players in the system are inclined to come together and governments can prevent incentives. So antimicrobial resistance is such an example, or dementia is, an ex is another example, or neglected tropical diseases. So in those situations, we do come together. Um, 
Other driving forces are game-changing technologies. When CRISPR emerged, suddenly everybody came together. Whenever we can't tackle things in, in isolation, we tend to come together. But we don't certainly do it by nature. Um, so clearly open innovation, I'm an advocate for open innovation in early drug discovery when it's technology focused, when it's target identification focused, and the SGC is a wonderful example, these things work. Mm. But from my own experience with some wonderful consortium, there's also the Milner Consortium in Cambridge, um, we have, which is a fairly new addition to the innovation ecosystem, I think three years old now. Um, we have had 24 collaborative projects, but we're struggling this consortium to move really to pre-competitive projects. <coughs> You know, we've been discussing wonderful topics such as NASH and NLFAD, and whenever it's technology, you know, organoid systems, IPSC, um, you know, we come together. But the later stages, I think we have to be critical and ask, is this really going to work? And how do we build the interface from open to closed? How do we make this a smooth transition? Because at the end, it will be closed and it will be competitive. So that would be my opening statement. Thank you, Kai. Chas, please. Well, I think with any sustainable partnership, it's got to be a win-win. And, and I'm just thinking sort of in the SGC, what we've done and what Mike has done in the DDU over the past decade plus is we've shown that academics can work with big pharma in a pre-competitive open way in early discovery. We've also shown that we can do that with patient groups. We've had some success with SMEs, mm -hmm. but what we've not really done is, for example, have that sort of conversation with NHS, with uh, payers, with regulators. And part of the spine discussion is exactly about sort of promoting knowledge exchange with those organizations and stakeholders. I mean, I think Kai's touched on it. I mean, we all recognize that if something is difficult, it takes a long time, it's expensive, it's risky, then it makes sense that you come together and try and do it once instead of 50 times in, in parallel. And I think our experiences have shown over the past 14 odd years, etc., that in the early space, uh, we can create win-wins with all these stakeholders mm -hmm. and we can uh, reduce duplication and wastage we can accelerate science, we can afford to do more risky things, and we can maybe even by working together push up standards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just think sort of in everything that we're trying to do, you know, if I think of the future and I'm looking here at Janet, sort of, you know, the, the aging consortium, et cetera, you know, we're, we're increasingly talking about prevention we're talking about long-term dosing, and then you think about, well, if it's long-term dosing, it's gonna to have to be safe, and it's gonna to have to be cheap. I think some of our science is getting maybe more complex. You know, we're now talking about it's not just the genome, it's the epigenome, and it's the microbiome, et cetera. And increasingly, we're all under pressure to produce cheaper medicines. Mm. Um, and when, and going back to Janet's comment, I mean, when we're, we're going to be in future treating more and more elderly patients, and they've got not just one disease, but half a dozen diseases. I mean, this is complex. And I think this, the only way we're going to crack this area open and realize that dream that Janet posed about a target that's going to affect multiple morbidity is by working together. You know, universities, industry, NHS, regulators, governments, mm -hmm. payers, patient groups, etc. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah, I do agree with you, Chad, that's an excellent point. And I actually do remember the early discussion we had on the spine when Mike first came up with these porous uh, interactions that the spine would have. I think that's really inspirational. And I think that brings me back to, to the term of open science. We still think a lot of open science, open innovation, as a f more direct interplay amongst existing players. I mean, we've been talking about the existing players now, but that actually brings an opportunity uh, to open up for players we have not yet seen in the scene. So as an example, we heard earlier today about AI, 
so we're bringing mathematicians, statisticians. Uh, I think we do have, as the open science is enabling, as the multi-way interaction, um, new players to actually come and deal with us. So perhaps I would like to hear more, perhaps on the panel at the first now, whether you think there are any group that we are missing at the moment for this open science debate, which is not just the technology drivers. I think we're lucky to have Tricia who can comment perhaps on a little bit of the social side, um, but also how we can also rethink of the role of existing players in the ecosystem. It's very easy now we see that the industry would bring it to the translation, the scientists would do the early basic discovery, but I think these lines are being blurred. So we'd like to hear the panel's opinion on that. Kai, please. I think, I think Martino made an excellent point and others in the discussion so far about connecting dots. Um, and connecting dots can be seen in connecting units, but, and, and you made a wonderful introduction about the emerging technologies. So I think we're now in a world where pharmaceutical companies, academia, other stakeholders are seeing disease as holistic. And we need to be much better when treating symptomatic disease. Mm. We, and, and we all agree with this, even pharma companies moving in this direction. So we need to detect it early. We need to try to prevent, in some cases, even cure. You know, in type 1 diabetes, antibody idiosyncratic antibody switches occur in the first year of life, some children. So we can detect this now, and we can prevent this. Mm -hmm. So I think the technology revolution, uh, the digital health, the med tech, the diagnostics, over-the-counter drugs, nutraceuticals, the microbiome, um, and prescription medicines together, we, we need to connect those dots to, uh, to treat disease holistically. And I think that will inevitably bring different people together. Thank you. It, it, it sounds so self-evident. It sounds so that this must be the way that everything will fall into place. Uh, but I'm worried about these metaphors. I'm worried about joining the dots. Um, Chaz said earlier on, everybody in the system has got to gain value. And, and yeah, right. But when you set up this wonderful system, actually there's going to be a huge amount of conflict. The conflict is inherent. There will never be a situation where all the dots are joined together and everything is seamless and everybody is getting everything they want from it. And I think we have to be careful about those kind of metaphors because in reality, it is always going to be messy. It is always going to be hard work. We are always going to have cultural clashes, political clashes, and I'm more interested in talking about how we're going to manage those conflicts, perhaps managing the conflicts productively. I, I'm, I don't mean to disagree with you, but hey, come on, that's what I've been hired for, really, isn't it? <laughs> you know, get a bit of an argument going. Is, is, if we make it seem as if just around the corner everything is going to be completely harmonious, that's not the way complex systems work. I, I think your point, if I can just directly answer it, I think yeah. your point is excellent. Um, but that's where the challenge is, but that's also where the opportunity is. Yes. And where I think the opportunities for this country is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this country in the, in the last two decades had tremendous clever science funding and there's so many, Martina introduced all those initiatives and they have their place and they have <coughs> generated amazing results. Mm -hmm. And now people talk about creating new things. And I would argue, why create new things? Why not connect mm. this investment cleverly? And SPINE is one of those initiatives. Mm. Now, you throw up the challenge, you're right, but that's yeah. where the opportunity is. I, I can't give you, in this short discussion, answers to no, all of no, this, no, but no. you're right. We need clever people addressing those challenges. We talked, so one last point, we talked about culture. Um, several times and, and I think one of the things that again the public sector should create is a career structure for I think what I would call wanderers between the worlds of pharma of NHS people who can in their career structure seamlessly move between those par parties to build a new culture where people talk and where some of those barriers and resistances are overcome and I think that's what that would be one way to make a new breed of people that have a career structure that allows them to move between those. And worlds. I think that, that, that is happening. Certainly at Oxford, we have an awful lot of in-reach and outreach programs, and I'm in fact setting one up myself, uh, a new, what we call a DPhil program, PhD program, which will, will have placements in industry and policy and all that kind of thing. It's absolutely essential. But there are also huge 
regulatory barriers and issues, which we haven't talked about yet, mm -hmm. those yeah. will never go away. The idea that you can get a committee to solve all those problems, they never will. We are mm -hmm. always going to have to struggle with them. The other thing I want to say uh, was the notion that innovators in any sector are by definition breaking the rules. So you have a set of rules and expectations, whether they're legal rules or professional rules. If you are an innovator, you're breaking those rules. And that's why the innovators are such interesting characters. And already we've heard some stories about innovative characters. Um, and we quite like the fact that they break the rules. And one of the things I think we need to do uh, if we're setting up intersectoral research collaborations, which is what I, I, I think we are, is, is to actually change the culture in a way, and that's not easy, in a way that celebrates the innovators breaking the rules, but also then retrofits and says, now how can the rules be uh, modified so that you don't have to break them in order to succeed, that kind of thing. We need to be more reflexive about that. As, as, you know, for example, as a university, the NHS needs to be more reflexive about that. So just uh, maybe a couple of comments. I mean, firstly, um, I think in this country we've got lots of researchers, but I think only a subset of those are innovators. Yep. And I think only a subset of those are what I would call entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, people who are thinking of really disruptive, step-changing things, etc. And I don't know if any of you have had a chance to meet with Niven, who's you know, set up this AI company in Boston. I mean, he's one of those sorts of individuals. And I think we need more of those individuals. And you know, let's go for sort of big projects, ambitious goals, create new industries, new platforms, new technologies. We need more Gates and Bezos and Zuckerberg and Jobs. We need more of those sorts of individuals. Mm -hmm. I think the second comment I would make is, and it goes back to Chris's point, um, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, what we're trying to do, I'm sure there's loads of other countries trying to do it in, including China and US and Singapore, Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it is, there is a competitive element even internationally, et cetera. But I do think in the UK, we've got some phenomenal resources. I think the NHS is an awesome resource in terms of patients and patient samples, opportunities to do clinical trials. But I think Frank's right, you know, we need to make it easier to do some of those innovative experiments inside the NHS, etc. I also think we've got some amazing resources like UK Biobank, Genome England, the Sanger Centre, etc., etc. And I think we need to exploit them. And um, because if we don't, you can be sure that people in China and the US will eventually will. Yeah, they already are. And um, before I give the, 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 the voice to the audience, one question is actually, you mentioned before, this is all very difficult to, to organize, etc. And who do you think should be stimulating all this discussion, actually framing? Is that something that we expect to grow organically from different groups here? Or do you think there's someone that should take a lead starting the discussion? Could, be the, could the spine be actually a good starting point for all of those seeding uh, initiatives? I, I think if you look at... Um translational medicine in the emergence in the last, well, maybe in the previous decade, uh, previous before that, in around 2000, 2010. Um, I, I was a researcher myself and suddenly the questions uh, occurred on the grant applications. I'm sure many of you have seen them. You know, what's the impact of your research? And at the beginning, let's be honest, you know, we were ir irritated by this. We believed in blue sky research. Mm -hmm. Why should we be accountable to the impact? So, and then there came a period when we just made these things up. But the grant giving body, it's true, you know, the grant giving bodies then forced us to uh, answer more questions, more details, to think mm -hmm. about it. So the answer to your question from my perspective is I think the impetus probably has to come from the public sector and it has to come from grant giving where money comes from. Mm -hmm. um, because where we are now is wonderful. People now answer these questions with joy and happiness and they really think about what the applicability is. No, they do. And they come together and they collaborate and they have multifaceted teams. And that's my experience anyway. Um, so there, there's a learning process. And I think the public sector and, and especially the, um, where, the, where the research money comes from is a good starting point. 
spine would be a, a, a nice way to do this. Thank you. Teresa, how have you? Yeah, um, the, the research literature on innovation suggests that one of the most effective ways of promoting complex innovation, and this is very complex innovation, you all know that, uh, is the network as a structure. So I love the idea of the spine, that's why I came here from Oxford today to meet you all. Um, it, theoretically, this is precisely the structure that you need to promote the kind of organic development um, of innovation that, that, that we all envisage. I do take issue with the idea of a pipeline that we start with basic science and then you know, we move forward through this um, sequence mm -hmm. and then at some point you have impact. Uh, this is something I, I've, I've bang on about. That's one of the things I, I publish on. Um, one of the reasons why the network is such a good form for complex innovation is that things are multi-directional and not just linear. So that means that, yes, of course, if I do a piece of research, I have to now anticipate what the impact might be, and I have to craft a, a plausible story in order to get the research money. And we're getting better at that game. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the network structure is such that it is also the case that because there are people here from policy, from the NHS, from industry, etc., and I'm just about to go and have lunch with some of them, the next time I write my grant application, what I say is going to take account of the things that I've heard and the different framings mm. of this problem, this challenge that I've heard from people who don't think the way that I think. In other words, the input from the potential end users of my research feeds into the ideas that I have for research and maybe even some of those people will be on the grant application as co-applicants with me. It's one of, the, one of the quality features when I'm looking, when I sit on my grant giving bodies. Is there a policymaker as a co-applicant, for example? And so I think we should think, yes, the spine is a, is, is a great brainchild. Was it Chaz's brainchild? Somebody, some group of people came up with this idea. But, but the, I think we need to think about uh, the knowledge going in multiple directions mm -hmm. in a kind of ecological way, rather than simply, let's get some money, do a piece of research, and then kind of trip it out. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So uh, I, I think, you know, if we think of what the spine is, it, it's basically five organisations initially, but as Mike said, potentially others we want to come in, but it's a group of people with complementary skill sets, uh, complementary infrastructures, a group of individuals who recognise that some of these problems are so big, we just can't do them on our own and we have to come together. And so, you know, the initial thing that we focused on is, Janet articulated it, how do we accelerate therapeutics for multiple morbidities associated with aging? This is a completely new way of doing drug discovery. The pharmaceutical industry currently isn't doing it, but we're gonna have to do it in the future. And so that's what it is. It's a group of these people coming together. And, um, and the aging project is the first one, and hopefully there will be others. But I think in that team, what we've done is we focused on what's the problem that we're trying to sort out? What's the science we need to do to address that problem? Who are the best people or institutions or infrastructures to help us do that science? And then we're thinking about the funding. So we've gone through that discussion, literally people's, uh, sorry, the problem, the science, the people, and now we're trying to get the funding. And I think that's the right way to do it. Okay. I would like to uh, open the question to the audience. Do we have one here, Adam? Hi, uh, Adam Stoughton, Chief Operating Officer at Oxford University Innovation. And in terms of pre-competitive research, the work that the SGC does is fantastic in supporting insights into new drug targets across a whole range of diseases. Um, some of those diseases um, present a massive commercial opportunity, so Alzheimer's, difficult, but you know, it's there. Um, others may not, whether it be tropical diseases, uh, whether it be antimicrobial resistance. Can the panel comment on the role of pre-competitive research in these opportunities where the commercial incentives are either negligible or non-existent versus the likes of 
um, neurodegeneration oncology, where the, you know, the pot of gold is absolutely at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> so I think you mentioned infectious <coughs> diseases, and you mentioned antimicrobial resistance. You know, this is um, an area that is uh, core to, sh to um, our business, to Shinogi's business. So um, the answer to this is that I don't think the pre-competitive research alone um, will address that issue. I think we need to look wider. We need to look at the impact, and I'm sorry, pharmaceutical industry will always say that, but the impact the regulators have, the yeah. clinical trial designers, and the remuneration models. So, and you know, we, we will, uh, we are this year launching a new cephalosporin, which is very important antibiotic for multi-drug resistant infections. Um, this will be a last resort antibiotic, and therefore it will not be a major um, revenue generator. So we and other companies are working in Davos and other circles around new remuneration models. We should have antimicrobial resistance is a global problem. As you know, we should have uh, several developed countries paying, paying into a fund that reimburses um, parties, companies, academia, and other players alike tackling these challenges irrespective of sales. So that would be one thing. So my answer to your question is, I'm sorry, I didn't address how pre-competitive research can do it, but I think I want to make the point it's a bigger story where well, we need to make sure that the clinical trial design, the regulatory hurdles, and the remuneration, we need to rethink that, I think. So maybe if I could just make a very brief comment. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I could make a case in the past two decades, maybe three decades, we've not made significant progress in dementia. We've not made significant progress in mental health. Maybe we've not even made significant progress in terms of rare diseases. I know we've got some therapies for rare diseases, but there's 7,000 of these diseases. We don't have that many therapies. There's still 95% of patients have no therapy. I'm glad that Kai is developing this sort of new generation cephalosporin. Um, but, you know, actually, as a community in the past three decades, I don't think we've made that much progress in coming up with new generations of antibiotics, etc. And even though Sally Davis has been talking about this for seven, eight years, etc. So the current way of doing it is not delivering on some of the biggest problems facing this planet. So we need to do something different. Call it open science, call it pre-competitive, call it open initially and close later, whatever. But somehow we just need to stop worrying about competition and making money, but more about working together to try and increase the probability of delivering on some of these problems. Mm -hmm. Trish? Not really my topic, but one thing I would add to that, Chaz, is surely this endeavour has got to be transnational, as well as kind of beyond individual companies or, or universities. Um, I, I just think in, unless it's a transnational initiative, it's not going on. I haven't seen much going on in the WHO, but maybe I'm not in the right committees there. But, you know, that's the kind of level it needs to be at, isn't it? I suppose as always, Trish, and I'm sure you, you'd appreciate this. I mean, sort of, you know, we've started by trying to bring these five institutes together. And now, as Mike said, we're bringing in others like Liverpool and Newcastle and so on and so forth. And inevitably, of course, what we're doing, science, is international. I mean, that guy's flown in from Boston to sort of listen to what, you know, we're going to be talking about today, etc. So, I mean, it will eventually get there, no doubt. Absolutely. And may I, before I said, pass to Frank, just add on that there are actually different business models looking at some of this non-targeted area by the, 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 the industry. Well, the NDI, which Mike mentioned earlier on, they're doing a lot of great work on product development initiatives, partnerships. Uh, another uh, interesting snippet that I actually happened to read on the news was Jim O'Neill actually saying, well, look, I did, we did that AMR review just a few years ago. No one took up the challenge. It's time for perhaps some of the governmental agencies say, forget it. If there's no competition here, there's no conflict, we, government or society, should really go and tackle that without being too nice to say, well, let's, let's become to um, not touch on the, the, the private initiative. So there are, the, there are many other models that we should be starting to consider uh, going forward. Uh, perhaps Frank would like to? I just wanted to ask Kai on your point, um, the two questions. One is, um, if the, the, these remuneration schemes existed, would you be much freer to work 
in the pre-competitive space uh, with the various academics that might have ideas or uh, other institutions that are not companies. So would that free up your hand to be able to think outside of the commercial payback? And the second question is, are you aware of any conversations happening about transferring future expenses into existing investment? Um, a bit like the whole um, uh, tuition fees accounting trick, which the coalition government did about basically moving things from one book into another one just by making people pretend to pay tuition fees. Um, is there something like that, some accounting trick in the cards across the West, well, let's say the, the, the rich nations, to try and help this thing? Because surely if we can crack some of the big problems, massive savings in the future, there must be some way to, to monetize them now. Excellent questions. Um, yeah, really good. He wants to know about your accounting tricks, Kai. <laughs> <laughs> So I think if you, I'm, I'm not an expert in, 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 in renumeration models, but um, I followed the debate. I mean, uh, it, it makes sense. If you uncouple sales from investment to get there, uh, and you actually simply reimburse people who are active in the area uh, and deliver um, through a joint funding pool from developed nations, I think the inclination to be more collaborative and be more open and less closed uh, for me, it's very clear that that will be an incentive. And um, it is happening. You know, in this particular area, there's a fund that the Wellcome Trust is involved called CARBX, uh, and the US institutions are involved. So AMR is, an, in, of course, an international and global issue. So these kind of funds are now offering flexibility, <coughs> encouraging collaborations, encouraging public-private partnerships. So these schemes are slowly happening. And in the uh, in WHO and in Davos and in those circles, there are many discussions. It just takes its time, I think, to get there. Um, your second question is an excellent question, um, and I struggle to, to, to give you a credible answer to that. Um, it's not, uh, not my area of expertise. Maybe others on the panel want to comment on that. But the, you know, the point of making an investment now for future return, or how do we actually measure um, a return anyway? As you say, if you can prevent disease, it can reduce cost. You know, that's a return, but uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on that area, maybe. Also, we're getting close to lunchtime as yeah. well, so I <laughs> you don't mind. If any one of you have a quick comment on that? I think lunch sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I don't, so, <laughs> so, I don't want to hear I'll mine. Just, so, I'll, just make, I'll just make one comment, though. The world is awash with cash from the financial easing that went on. And it all ends up in places like sovereign wealth funds and European Investment Bank. Uh, have, sitting on three trillion, I think, euros. Um, and some of this has to be spent now for the public good. And what better public good could there be than new next generation antibiotics, for example, or, or treatments for dementia? So I, 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 nobody's got a magic wand, but this is a G8, G20 problem. And some of this money that's just sitting doing absolutely nothing needs to be mobilized <laughs> yeah, for the very societies and people who generated it in the first place. So very good. I'm not totally Washing despondent. And on that uh, uh, note, I think we should break for, for lunch. Yes, thank you all thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.